All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to a part three in the series that we started way, way, way back a long time ago, back in distant memory. It was 2015. Okay, back way back and then. We started this series called Burnt Out. I know we've been off for a couple weeks, but what we are talking about in this series is how to create margin in our overstuffed, overworked, kind of pulled to the extreme kind of lives. And what we are talking about is how to create margin in the three most important areas of life. Okay, and we covered the first part before the new year. All right, we'll cover part three today and part four next week. We talked about in week one how to create margin in our time, in our schedules. We're going to talk today about how to create margin in our finances, and we'll finish up next week in our relationship, in our relationships. Now, just as kind of like a definition of what does margin mean and why is it such an important topic? Well, we agreed that the working definition for margin is the difference between our load and our limit, okay, between what I have and what I need. So just as a simple example, okay, we kind of talked about our time last time, and I said, if I have 30 minutes between now and my next appointment, and I know it takes me 25 minutes to get there, then I have five minutes of margin. I have 30 minutes, I need 25 minutes, my margin is five. Margin is whatever I have in excess of what I need. Now, this series, from the feedback that y'all have been given to me, has really touched a nerve with some people, in a positive way, okay, in a positive way. And I hear, I've heard a lot of good feedback, that people, this series really seems to be hitting home with a lot of people, and I think the reason why, if you'll, especially you're going to stick with me today, you're going to realize, I'm not really saying anything that profound. Like, I ain't teaching you something that you didn't know before. I'm not teaching you that if, if you have if you need 25 minutes to get somewhere, then you should start to think about it more than five minutes in advance. I'm not, I'm not teaching you anything profound, but what I discovered is that there's so many of us who are really burnt out, as the title implies, and really are stretched too thin. You know what I liken it to? I gave you this analogy in the first week of the series. You know when you have a garage, can you move into a new house and you got a big garage? So once you have a big garage, or maybe if you're not a garage, you can also apply this like, I would say, for me, it's garage. Maybe ladies might be like a closet, all right? So you feel like, I have this big closet. I got this big garage. So you instantly start to put stuff in, and you put more stuff. You say, I got this bigger garage, so I can put more stuff in. Bigger garage, put more stuff in. You keep putting, 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 putting in, and then you walk in there one day, and it's just filled is, is an understatement. Everything is overflowing on top of everything, and you can't find anything in there, and, it's, and, and everything is lost in there, and you don't know what's going on inside there. And in an effort to get more out of your garage... You lost control of your garage and you hate the garage. And just walking by the garage makes you feel like tense. This is how many of us are approaching life these days, unfortunately. And when we look at our schedules, we look at our finances, we look at our relationships, we try to stuff more in, thinking that we can get more out of life. But in the end, we end up losing control and losing our ability to enjoy those things. What I said in week one is that while overstuffing the garage or overstuffing the closet seems like a, good, like a good idea in the short term, in the long term, the three effects of having no bar margin in your life. Number one, stress goes up. Number two, relationships go down. And number three, we lose sight of what's really important. You know this. When the margin goes down in life, the stress goes up. The relationships, they go down. We focus less on relationships because we focus more on whatever it is that we're lacking. And then number three, we lose sight of what's important. We talked about our schedules in the first week. This week, we're going to talk about our money and our finances. And I got great news for you right off the bat, as I told y'all before. I'm going to do an entire message on money, and I ain't going to ask you for a penny. This is not a, hey, we're going to talk about money, so we're going to get your checkbook because he's going to make you feel guilty for not giving. I intentionally, just to show you, intentionally wanted this message to be after the new year so no one was thinking I'm making the end of the year push. Okay, you know the end of the year push from all your friends and all your, your different organizations that end of the year push. Well, it's the new year, so you already missed it. If you, if you missed the tax write-off, you already missed it. But this is not about anything that I want from you. I promise you. This is what I want for you. We'll hopefully see that today. Let's start off with this verse from the book of Proverbs, chapter 21, verse 20. It says, In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all that he has. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all that he has. What do you notice interesting about that verse? Whose house is full of stuff? In the house of the rich are stores of food and oil, right? 
The house of the wealthy. That's what we would think. It doesn't say the house of the rich. It doesn't say the house of the wealthy. It doesn't say in the house of the six-figure income. Or it doesn't say in the house where you have a rich uncle who left you a lot of stuff. It has nothing to do with how much you intake. It's saying the difference between a person with margin and without margin. A person who has and a person who doesn't. It has nothing to do with being rich or not rich. Being wealthy or not wealthy. It has everything to do with being wise and not wise. What we are going to talk about today is how to be wise. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how big your... This message applies equally to someone who's making $5 an hour, someone who's making $50,000 a year, or someone who makes $50,000 a month. It's the same message because the message is not about dollars and cents. The message is about principle of how we manage one of the most important resources to us. I always say, it's your time, it's your money, and it's your relationships. These show the important things in your life. How you spend your time, how you spend your money, and who you spend that time and money with. So today we're going to look at what does it mean to be wise with our finances. And I'll, I'll make it visual for you because I know some people are visual learners. So let's take that same verse and do it in a visual way. Here we go. We're going back to 12th grade or 11th grade when you did geometry and, pl and plotting and axis and stuff like that. We're going to have a graph right here with two factors. On the up and down is income, okay, how much money you make. And on the bottom axis is time. So most of us, at some point in time, started with zero dollars, and then what happened is we started to make money. And forget about the minor fluctuations along the way. Where you were 10 years ago versus 15 years ago versus 20 years ago, most likely, even though you may have ups and downs along the way, your, your income has steadily gone up, all right, for the most part. And like, again, some people, you maybe have dry periods, but for the most part, most of us, our income has steadily gone up as we have gone along. And during that time, our, our spending hopefully looks like this, where our spending increased as our income increased, but hopefully at a slightly lower rate. The space between the income and the spending between what I have and what I need is called margin. That's exactly what we're talking about. Now, I put this up on the screen. I put this up on the screen right now. You see this thing right here. You see that margin in there. What feeling is inside the pit of your stomach right now? What feeling is inside your bones right now? How do you feel as you look at that after you finish the Christmas holiday season and you know them bills are coming and they're due January 15th? How do you feel as you look at this? Ah, oh, doesn't that look good? See, here's what I know about every single person here. Even though I don't know many of you here, I know this about you. You want this. You want this badly. This is what you desire when you open up your mint.com. This is what you desire. You desire to see your income and then see your spending. Because you know why? As I said in week one of this series, you know what happens in margin? The best things in life happen in margin. When you're in this state, this is when you go to your wife and you say, surprise. We're sending the kids to grandparents this weekend and we're going away to a bed and breakfast. And we're not stressed about how we're going to pay for it. When you're in this margin right here, this is when... You, your kid turns 17 and starts their senior year of high school and you aren't looking to rob a bank to figure out how you're going to put them into college. When you have margin in life is when it's your parents' 50th wedding anniversary and you say, you know what? I'm going to honor them with a nice cruise, tickets, whatever it is. And again, I'm not stealing from my kids' college fund to have to do that. When there's margin, we sleep better. When there's margin, we fight less. When there's margin, our health is better. When there's margin, the best things in life happen in this area. When there's margin, I don't wake up in the middle of the night thinking, what happens if I lose my job tomorrow? And I don't have to work 30 hours a week overtime more than anybody else because I know I got to keep on them because I cannot afford to lose my job. You know what else happens when there's margin, financial margin? Remember last week we spoke, or two, three weeks ago, we spoke about time margin. When you have financial margin, you can purchase time margin. You can... Hire someone to clean your house so you have more time to yourself, more time with the kids. You can hire someone to mow your lawn and you don't have to worry about it. And now we say, you know what? I can play with my kids for that hour a week instead of I have to mow my lawn for that hour a week. The best things in life happen when there's margin. And I would say to every single person right here, you have to do whatever it takes, legally, of course, okay, within under, under the law of the United States of America. Legally, we have to do whatever it takes to get to this point. Does anybody disagree with that? They think that this is a bad way to live life right here. Does anyone think, you know what? 
this is not the way to live life at all, and these people are missing out on life. Anybody think that? Here is, unfortunately, where most of us are. And I was being generous. I was being generous. Because if we're honest, most of us have zero margin. And I don't even want to show when that line is above the other line. I'm not even getting into that one. I'm gonna assume, like, that's a different session altogether. But most of us, this is our reality. This is our reality. That regardless of how much we make, our spending goes exactly up with it. And we think the problem is we don't make enough money. The problem is we don't make, that's not the problem. We think the problem is the president or the Congress or the economy. Everyone else has the same president and Congress and economy that you do. They somehow find a way to manage. You know what happens when you allow your, spe- your income to drive your spending when there's no margin? Well, that's when, at the end of every month, you have to do very creative mathematics in terms of how to pay the bills. And that's when your wife comes home with a new pressure cooker. Now, you ready to pressure someone, cook someone's head. <laughs> and this is where you say to yourself, you know what? I'm young. I'm single. It's time for me to move out of my parents' house. And I know this is what God wants me, but you know what? Just can't do it. Can't do it. How can I? Can't afford it. This is when you read the word of God. You don't even hear it from your priest. You read the word of God, the same word of God I read, and you hear that it is stealing from God when we don't tithe. And you know in your heart of hearts that mama taught you and your dad taught you that you have to give and you have to be generous and you're not supposed to keep all the money yourself and you have to tithe. And you know that, but you can't. And you're tempted. And honestly, I'll be honest with you, sometimes you come to me and say, you know what, I'm not tithing because of this and because of this. And I want to, with all my heart, say, you know what, like, I wish I could make an exception for you. But I can't tell you that God is going to bless you for disobeying his word. And this is where you're tempted to disobey God. And again, this has nothing to do with your income. This has nothing to do with your income. Because this was a habit you started from very, very, very early on, which is however much you make, you spend. And I tell you what, I read, I read a survey the other day. It's basically, I'll give you the, the summary of it, okay, some statistics. And you won't believe me on this one. You won't believe me just as I don't believe it unless I talk to people. I know this to be true. It was a survey of people. Basically, the summary of the survey, people, let's say people, the majority of people in this room are making between fifty dollars and $70,000 a year. Okay, I know that's, you know, whatever. Let's just kind of take, that was kind of the, the area of the survey. Did you know that if you make fifty dollars to $70,000 a year, and I raised your income to $250,000 a year. You would say, hey, my life would be golden. Hey, if I made $250,000 a year, man, I'd be throwing money out the window. Well, did you know that people who make $250,000 a year who have the same habits as we do when we make less, they have the same habits, these habits right here, they feel even, not I want to say the same amount of pressure and stress, they actually feel more. They are more stressed out financially and feel more financial pressure. You say, wait a minute, you make Five times what I make. How can that be? Because it's not a matter of income. It's a matter of habits. And you know what? You're stressed out over, how am I going to pay the bills if I lose my $50,000 a year job? Well, if you had a $250,000 a year job, and you try to pay the bills without that, like there's lots of jobs out there that you can make $30,000, $40,000, $50,000. There ain't many that pay you $250,000. The higher you go in your income, and you don't fix these habits, the more you'll continue to be a slave to your spending and live under stress and pressure. When this, when this is the picture of our life, this is when marriages aren't as happy. This is when we don't sleep as well at night. This is when we don't enjoy things, and we say, we look at at the the simple things in life that we want to do, that we used to be able to do, and and, and life becomes burdensome because we can no longer do them. I promise you, this is not a financial issue. This is a spiritual issue. How is this a spiritual issue? Look what our Lord Jesus Christ says here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 21. It says this. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. I can say that in a slightly different way. I can say what Jesus says is, is where your money is, where your money is invested, how you spend your money will dictate where your heart goes. And for many of us, for many of us, unfortunately, we are a slave to our marginless finances. We are. We're slave. You know what a slave means? A slave means have no freedom. A slave means I want to do A, but I can't. I got to do B. Well, how many of us, hey, you know what? I want to take this vacation, but I can't. I want to help this person in need, but I can't. I want to send my kids to that camp or that I want to send my kids to that school, but I can't. How many of us are slaves to the poor decisions that we have made financially, the habits that we have built up over all these years? And yes, you can say it's a problem because you need more income, but I guarantee you, if you had that problem at 50,000, you're going to have it at 60, you're going to have it at 7, you're going to have it at 80, you're going to have it at 9, you're going to have it all the rest of your life until you realize this is not a financial issue. This is a spiritual issue, and it is directly correlated to your ability to be able to follow our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of us, our bills are running our lives? Our lives are run by our mortgage payments, by our credit card bills. Some of us, car payments are like a, a, like a pet. Okay, we just take them from place to place, and we always have to have one with us at all times. And we don't know what it means to have no loan payments, or no car payments, no none of that kind of stuff. That's what it means to be a slave. I was reading this nice article too. It was talking about how it was talking about magic moments at Christmas. Okay, and it was saying about how magic moments. What are magic moments at Christmas? You we read about them all the time, and they make your heart fuzzy and warm. When you know there was this family, like it was a story about a family. The dad had lost his job. The mom wasn't working. They couldn't buy kids presents. And then like the neighbor's family came in and said, you know what? We want to buy presents for your, for your kids this Christmas. We want them to have a happy Christmas. So they bought, you know, however much it was. That's a, like, that's a, that's a feel-good moment. Or stories of a family that's like hard on their luck. You know what I mean? And someone who's got medical bills. And then someone who just jumped in and was able to say, you know what? I have the margin that I can help you. I, God has given me the margin. I've had good habits. You know what? I just want to help you. And I just want to give you, here's $500 just to get through this season. Like, those are magic moments. Those make you feel good. No one has ever told me a magic, heartwarming Christmas story of, you know what? I walked into the store, and there they were. The boots were 30% off. I was going in expecting to pay 100%, and I only had to pay 70%. This is a magic moment for me in Christmas. No one ever walked in and said, I walked into the dealer for a Toyota, and the Lexus was just screaming out my name. Spending money on ourselves, spending more than we make, doesn't make us feel good on the inside. What makes us feel good is when we have the margin to do good things with that money. I'll give you another one. Many of us are slaves not just to our bills in a financial way, but we're slaves to our bills in an emotional way. Doesn't Jesus himself, actually in the same chapter, in Matthew 6, he says, do not worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, or what you will wear. He do not worry about these things. God will take care of you. How many of us disobey that commandment? It's not even an option to obey that commandment. And you know what? If I had your financial picture in my life too, I'd be pretty stressed as well. If I had your bills, if I had this income and this kind of, of spending, and this was my bills match my income, I wouldn't be able to not worry about it either. I wouldn't be able to rest easy. I wouldn't be able to be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication, let my request be made known to God. I wouldn't be able to do that stuff either. Here's my question to you. Why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we do this to ourselves? Does anybody like the stress? Does anybody like the tension of, 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 of just waiting and just moving money from this credit card to this credit card and then from this credit card to this credit card? Anybody like that? Why do we do that to ourselves? So we can have a bigger yard? So we can have a cooler car? So we can have a 17th pair of shoes? Why do we do that to ourselves? Today, as I said, I promise you, I don't want anything from you. I'm not talking today about anything that I want from you. I don't want you to give because of today's message. I don't want anything from you. Today is what I want for you. And the word that I say I want for you is I want for you is freedom. I want freedom from you, from the slavery, to the debt, and to the financial burdens. When we spoke about time, if you remember, I said our time is limited, so we have to limit what we do with our time. Remember I said that? I said, we only have so many minutes, hours, days, and because our days are limited, we have to limit what we do with our time. Because our time is limited, we limit what we do with our time. You would think the same would be true about money, right? 
If our, time, if our money is limited, we have to limit what we do with our money. But this is America. <laughs> Land of the free and the zero down and zero interest for the first 12 months. So here in America, you don't need to limit what you do with your money, even though your money is limited. So here's our truth for today. And I'm going to put this up on the screen. And as soon as I say this, all of you intuitively are going to say, this makes sense. Something that you've never maybe like articulated, but you know deep in your heart, you know this to be true. Here's our truth for today. Standard of, standard of living does not equal quality of life. Agree? Lots of head nods all around. This makes sense to us. Standard of living is not the same as quality of life. This is intuitive. It's something maybe we've never said, but we all know to be true. Outside these walls, the culture will tell you the exact opposite. And they will tell you, if you want a higher quality of life, which we all want, then you must raise your standard of living. You drive this car. Do you want a better life? Drive this car. You'll have a better life. You have a house with a yard like this. But if you had a house with a yard like this, your life would instantly be better. You wear this sucker's cologne. Man, you wear this cologne and watch, they flock to you. This is all of culture out there. And I'm not blaming culture. I'm blaming us, okay? Don't, we're not, I'm not saying like I'm blaming marketing or blaming like, no, we're not blaming anyone out there. But this is the reality. The reality out there is that everyone out there is trying to convince us in here that the order, the way to increase the quality of your life is increase your standard of living. The truth is, when you increase your standard of living, you increase their quality of life, not your own. Because we know intuitively, this makes sense to us, that I can have a bigger house, I can have a nicer car, I can have nicer clothes, but that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to have a better life. I'll give you an example. Example, and again, one, this just makes sense to us. Again, I'm not teaching anything new. Like, I'm not saying anything rocket science right here. Like, I'm not making discoveries right here. No one's going to give me a Nobel Peace Prize for what I'm, I'm saying right here. This is stuff that we all know inside of us. Compare our lives today. Go back two generations. Go back to your grandparents. And again, this is not a scientific study. This is just something inside. Go back to your grandparents. And let's compare our quality of life which can usually be measured by happiness and how happy and satisfied we and fulfilled we are, let's compare it to two generations ago. Your grandparents, whether here in the, in the United States of America, whether in Ethiopia, whether in Egypt, wherever it may be. Let's compare their happiness to our happiness and see which one. Most of us would agree, probably, that if you compare our stress to their stress, who had more stress? Us or them? Us. Who had more anxiety? Us or them? Who had more health-related, stress-related health problems? Who smiled more, enjoyed life more, hung out with friends more? Who spent more time doing the things that add to the quality of life? Us or them? Them. Yeah, it ain't even close. It ain't even close. Okay? Now let's compare standard of living. Let's compare their home to our homes. Look, I want to be clear here. I'm not right now saying that it's bad to have a big home. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. And if God has given you, it's, I would, my home, some people would say it's a gigantic home. Like when I was living in an apartment, I'd say my home now is gigantic. Other people, they'd say it's a tiny little thing. So it's big home is a subjective term. It's a subjective term. But all I'm saying is, let's compare our homes to their homes. Today, sometimes I walk into homes, and again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Like, what's bad is when the income and spending are the same. But if you have the margin, and God has given you the ability, and you have a big house, more power to you, like, I'm not saying that's wrong. Sometimes I walk into homes today, and I, and I, I wonder if I need a map to get around. You ever been to these homes? You, you drive in, okay, first thing you see is the three-car garage. Two people who drive, three-car garage. I don't understand why. Three-car garage. You see the lawn and the outside as if, 
like the, the people from the golf course came and took care of that grass. It is so professional, okay? You walk up to the house and you notice the big ceiling right off the bat. You ring the doorbell and what do you hear? See, I'm one of them suckers. I, my doorbell just goes ding dong, okay? But these homes, it's like an opera, like a long dong. Like you know you're in the house of somebody important right now. And you automatically think what I think. Man, these people are rich. Man, these people are rich. Man, they're so rich, they must be the happiest people in the world. But the truth is, oftentimes the exact opposite. And yeah, they got a big house. But see what that big house is costing them. It's costing them she didn't want to go back to work, but she had to go back to work against her will. It's costing them that the kids basically raised themselves because in order for them to fund this house, both have to work and both have a 10-hour day plus an hour and a half commute each way. So basically the kids raised themselves, but they got a big house. Compare that house to your grandparents' house. How about your grandparents' house? How big was it? Half the size. Half the size. No three-car garage, no two-car garage, no one-car, probably a carport, if even that. They didn't have, they mowed their own lawn, and they had bald patches in their lawn, and they somehow survived. Their doorbell, one of them sucker doorbells, just, hey, maybe no doorbell. The knockers, boom, boom, boom. And they were happy, and their kids were happy, and to this day, everyone loves to go back to grandma and grandpa's house. Brings back good memories. And they raised six kids in that house too, by the way, right? <laughs> Had to be they raised six kids in that house. Why? Why? Why does this make sense to us? Because standard of living is not the same as quality of life. Look at this verse. Proverbs 15, verse 16. Solomon says, Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Would anyone disagree with that? You know what he's saying right here? Give me the small house with people that love each other inside. Give me the small house with peace inside. Give me the small house with joy inside versus the big house with the ceilings and the garage and all that stuff, but they're stressed every month. And yeah, and give me, give me the little, the used car with 100,000 miles on it versus the nice fancy car, but every time we're in the fancy car, we fight with each other and we hate each other's guts because we're paying money on this car and we're stressed out. Give me... The nice, normal people's shoes versus the 17,000 pairs of boots and shoes and all this stuff. But give me the freedom to be able to live life and enjoy my life with what I have. Better a little with fear of the Lord and great wealth with turmoil. The truth is that standard of living is not the same as quality of life. I'm going to say the same thing in a slightly different way. But this now is not a truth. This is a lie that we all believe, which is the inverse of what I just said. And this one, I guarantee you, again, I don't know you, but I guarantee you have said what I'm about to say right now. You have said it, and I bet you a lot of us are saying it even as we speak right now. Ready? Happiness equals a little more than I have right now. Right? Smirks all over the place. Meaning some of you said it just this morning. If my income, like if I get this promotion and I get that level of income, I'm set. Set for life. Like I drive this car and I hate this car. You know, if I could just had this car, I'd be set. If I just had, was able to like get this, this the, the, these new shoes or, or like be able to change my wardrobe, you know, if I was able just to, to have this, then I'd be happy and I'd be set for life. This is, again, out there, this is what the world is telling us. You got a car, but a new car is better. You got a phone that calls people, but if you had a new phone, you'd be better off. You have a laptop, but if you had a newer laptop, this is what the world is telling us, is that if you had a little bit more than you have right now, then you'd be happy. And again, because this is America, this is not only what we believe, this is our God-given right to be happy. Pursuit of happiness, that's what we believe in this country. So that's why we say it's okay. You don't have enough money for it, that's okay. Don't tell me, can you afford it? Tell me, can you afford it 12 months from now? Zero down, 0% zero interest. The problem is, again, why is this a lie? Why is this a lie? 
Why do you know this is a lie? Because I guarantee you that if you're saying this today, you said the same thing when you had a lot less, didn't you? You said the same thing. Go back, rewind 10 years ago. Go back 10 years ago. Your house was half the size. Your income was $20,000 a year less. You had a used car and you had a cell phone that was the size of a brick. And you yearned for the flip one day. That one day I'll get the flip. The razor, whatever it is. And you thought to yourself, man, if I could have gone to that you, to 2006 you, and say, hey, this is where are going to be in 2016. You say, oh my goodness, I'll be living the dream. I'll be the happiest person in the world. I'm going to have this big house with a big yard. I'm going to have a, 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 a cell phone that's like this size. And it does things other than call people. Like I'm going to be living the dream. And you thought, just like I thought, when I started working, my first job was at a place called Heckinger. Who remembers Heckinger? Who remembers Heckinger? Okay, throwback, okay. Heckinger was before Home Depot. Home Depot put us out of business. Still been bitter, but that's okay. Man, when I was at Heckinger, I said, you know what? Man, if I make it to $12 an hour one day, man, like I'll be the richest guy in the world. Like all the girls will love me. Like I'll just be like throwing money away, like air everywhere if I get to $12 an hour. You get, I eventually got a job at Superfresh when I was in college. Remember Superfresh? Superfresh, a grocery store? Okay, I don't know if they're in this area. And again, making $12 an hour, but you know what? Man, if I get to the point of like, I could be salaried like that lady, or I could be like, if I could be bagging, oh man, if I could be a bagger, what? Like I was just an unstocker. Okay, un un unload the trucks. Man, if I could be, a, oh, I'd be living the dream. Get to college. And you get out of college, and I made a job was $40,000 a year when I got out of college. I said, $40,000? What am I going to do with it? Like, I'm going to clean my ears with it. You know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do with all this money? This is going to be all around the place. And when you're 40, you want 50. When you're 50, you want 60. When you're 60, you want 70. And so goes the game. Why? Because it's not a financial issue. It's a spiritual issue. If your income matches your spending, you will always feel pressure. You will always feel stress. You will always feel like, I will be happy as soon as I have more, and you will never actually attain it. I'll give you another fact to prove this to you, and this is astounding. Los Angeles Times had an article about one of the fastest growing real estate segments in the United States of America. It might be, I think it's the fastest. You know what it is? Storage units. Storage units. Did you know that storage units is big business in this country because of this principle, because we believe that a little more will make me happy. How many storage units are in this country right now? More than 50,000. More than 50,000 means one in every 10 Americans has so much stuff that they can't fit it in their own house, they need to buy space to put all their stuff in. Let me read you a, statistic, or a quote from this article. United States currently has upward of 50,000 storage facilities. That is more than five times the number of Starbucks. Currently, watch this one. Currently, there's 7.3 square feet of self-storage space for every man, woman, and child in the nation. There's 7.3 square feet for every man, woman, and child in this nation, which means it is physically possible that every American could stand all at the same time under the canopy of self-storage roofing. If every one of us stood side by side, we would have seven square feet. I'd have this much space. Okay, this little seven square feet right here. And I could stand. And all of us could stand and under the self-storage. Why? Do we really have that much more stuff? You know what? We do, because the article goes on. <clears throat> Your grandparents, two generations ago versus today. Clothing. Grandparents, generation, had an average of nine outfits. Nine. That was the average. Including your dress clothes, your work clothes, your church clothes, your play clothes. Nine. Today? Yes? 30. 30 is the average. And it made it clear, that's just outfits that doesn't count accessories. In this country, the average family throws away or gives away 200 pounds of clothes every year. 200 pounds. And our closets are packed. We give away 200 pounds. And it's not just adults. We do it to our kids. We destroy our kids. You know why? The average child in the developed world owns over 200 toys, but plays with only 12. And if you have kids, you know this is true. 
Watch this one. This is shame on us parents. The United States of America currently has 3% of the world's children, 40% of the world's toys. This is not a financial issue. This is a spiritual issue. We bought the lie that if we had more, we would be more happy. Has all those storage units led to greater level of happiness and satisfaction in the world today? Are our children just the happiest kids on the block because they got all that stuff? Or have we never seen a lower level of satisfaction in life? St. Paul says it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 9. He says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Look, as you're reading this, don't take this as, as a commandment. What does this sound a lot like? Like if I remove the Bible reference verse, what does this sound a lot like? Does this sound like a, a, a boss yelling at his coworker? Does this sound like someone like uh, speaking to like a servant saying, this is how you should live your life? Does that sound what this is? You know what this sounds to me? This sounds to me like advice a dad would give his son as he's moving out of the house, doesn't it? This sounds to me like someone who loves their child is telling them, watch out out there. Because if you fall into this trap of not being content, then you, many people, fell into temptation and a snare and to many foolish and harmful lusts. And he goes even more blunt and says this, verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. And watch this. This epitomizes life in America today for so many of us. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Not been pierced by the enemy, but pierced ourselves. Why? Because we fell for the lie. When God commands us to, for financial margin, what he's basically saying is you have a choice. I, as your father, I love you. I want you to have the best marriage in the whole wide world. I want you to have peace in your marriage. I don't want you to have a fighting marriage, but just say, hey, you know what? We fight all the time, but we have really cool cars. Look at our cool cars. I want you as a single young person to have the freedom that when I call you to take the next step in life, I call you to follow your dream. I call you to take a step of faith that you don't say, well, I can't do it because I'm stuck here and I got bills to pay and I can't move out of mommy and dad's house. But you know what? I got really nice shoes. Look at my shoes, God. I want you to have the freedom that you can do the things that create those magic moments when you have people in need around you. Said another way. Jesus said it this way. This is a continuation of what he said earlier about where your treasure is, there your heart will be. In Matthew 6, verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. You cannot. Not, you should not. Not is not a good idea. He's saying it is not physically possible. Have you ever had, I hope you've never had it, but you ever a situation where you have two bosses, where you have two supervisors, and one is telling you this, and the other one's telling you this, and you kind of report to both. That's the worst situation being in work. And many of us, how we live in our lives. You can't. You either serve God, or you serve the competitor to God. You know what the competitor to God is in your life? The number one competitor to God in your life will not be the devil. I believe it will be stuff. Stuff. And you can define stuff however you want. Some of you stuff is cars, some of you it's houses, some of you it's shoes, some of you it's cell phones and technology, whatever stuff is for you. Jesus didn't say you cannot serve God and the devil. He didn't say you cannot serve God and the world. He said you cannot serve God and stuff. You have to choose which one of these is going to take the full attention of your heart. Now, with that said, Practically, if you're struggling to have margin in your life, I know that the majority of people in this room, believe me, I don't by any means pretend that I'm an expert on all things, finances, and things like that. I don't think I'm an expert. And I think the majority of people in this room are 10 times smarter than me. And you know, for the most part, what you need to do. Like, you don't need me to tell you where you need to cut back the spending. You don't need me to tell you how to create margin. You just need to kind of make a decision that you need to do it. But you don't need me to tell you. But for the sake of those who maybe they don't know how to do it, 
Maybe your parents didn't teach you good financial practices and you say, you know what, I'm kind of lost in this thing, Father Anthony. Like, what do I do? Let me give you five very simple, and I'll just run through them real quick, practical things that you can do of what, here's more, what I want to say, is what I would do if I was in your shoes, okay? What I would do if I was in your shoes. And take it or leave it, okay? Again, the idea is not do what I'm telling you, but you're smart enough to figure this out, but just in case, kind of kick, get you on the right start. First thing you got to do is you got to decide. And if I have, in these five steps, this is 90% of it. 90% of it is this first one, is decide. Decide to say, 2016, this is the year I get out of debt. This is the year I stop, my spending matches my income. This is the year that I build margin. I said earlier that standard of living and quality of life are not the same. You know how you build your standard of living? You, bi you build it by debt, by spending more. You know how you build your quality of life? By discipline, by spending less. Discipline isn't easy. So you have to make a decision. You need to basically say, just like the person who's been eating unhealthy, I just had the heart attack, say, you know what? Enough is enough. This is the year. I'm getting in shape. I'm stopping all the junk. This is the year I do it. You need to make the same decision financially. Say, enough is enough. 2016 is my year. I'm not going to solve this overnight. But I'm going to say, 2016, I'm making this. I'm solving it. And I'm ready to discipline myself to make sacrifices because this is important. Decide. Number two. Number two. Set a goal. Whatever goal. I don't care what the goal is. Set a goal. What are you aiming for? What do you want to accomplish? If I was in your shoes, I would think of a one-year goal, but I would also think of a five-year goal and maybe even potentially a 10-year goal. I would say to myself, let's say me and my wife right now, okay, our kids are uh, 10 and 8. I would say, you know what? By the time my son is 18, this is where I want to be as far as college savings. Set a goal. I would say, you know what? This is how much I owe on the house. This is when I want to pay off the house. I owe another 27 years on the house. I want to get it paid off in 24 years. Set a goal. Maybe your goal would be, I need to get out of debt. I need to pay back my student loans. I need to move out of this house. Like Whatever it may be. Like I have to set a goal. And don't just think short term. Think long term. Dream where you want to be. This is exactly, again, like the losing weight. This is where you say, my goal is to look like this. My goal is to fit into a this. Those are the people who are the successful ones that say, here's the wedding dress. I need to fit in this thing by this day. Those are the people who can push themselves through the day to day. Set yourself a goal. Number three, this is where we start to do the sacrifice and the pain in the butt part. Track every dollar. Track every dollar. And I would say for two months. Track every dollar, where it's going, how you're spending it. If you struggle with this, there's all kinds of software. And again, I'm not an expert in the mint.com, all kinds of crazy apps. Me personally, I've been doing this for a few years now, and this is absolutely annoying and a pain, but by far the most helpful thing you'll ever do. I guarantee. They even say, again, to, I'm paralleling with the weight loss one. The people who just write down what they eat on a day-to-day -day basis, the results of them losing weight is incredible. Just writing down where you spend your money and seeing it on paper, you'll be shocked at where it goes. Spend two months, two months at least, and track every single dollar of where it goes. I heard a preacher from the South said the following. He said, everybody needs to be a knowing or all the money is a going. Track where all your money goes. Again, there's all kinds of software. Me personally, I'm old school. The more they do these apps, I don't like any of that stuff. I got a piece of paper in my house. Okay, I got the spreadsheet of all the different categories. And anytime we spend in one, I write it down right there. I'm, I'm old school pen and paper. That's easy for me. Whatever. Whatever works for you. Number four, cut spending. Again, I'm not preaching like rocket science here. Cut spending. The income, yeah, you could try to make the income go up. Again, I'll tell you another funny one that I heard. It said three ways to create March. Your income up, your spending down, or Washington, D.C., the debt ceiling goes up. Okay. So if you can raise the debt ceiling in your own home somehow, okay, you can, but... Sorry, tough crowd. Okay. <laughs> Selection year. I should have I should have known better. Okay. Point here is you have to start to make some sacrifice and say, you know what? I am not gonna go to Starbucks anymore on the way to work. I'm not gonna do it. I am not gonna eat out every single day at work. I will eat out on Thursdays and Tuesdays, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm packing lunch. You gotta make some hard decisions. And let me again give you something 
uh, show you something that you're allowed to say. We have been brainwashed and thinking that we're not allowed to say what I'm about to say. You are allowed to say, I want that. And in fact, I want you to say a lot of, I want that. Because you know what's worse than I want? Is I owe for that. Like, I want a new car. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. It's better than I owe a lot of money because I bought a new car. I want to go out to eat. That's great. It's better than I now owe all this on my credit card because I went out to eat. Change I owe and leave it into I want. See, in this country, we've been taught that you never need to say I want. Once you want, you have. Once you want, you have. There's a lot of things I want I don't have because I'm not willing to turn I want into I owe. Get rid of I owe. Stick with I want. I want is better. And then number five, after you cut your spending, and this is especially for the people who are struggling with debt, you need a plan, a long-term plan of how to get out of debt and increase this margin because the margin should be increasing as I get older, not decreasing. Develop a plan, a long-term plan. You say, how do I develop a plan? Look, here's what you do. I'm going to give you very practical. This is dummy proof, what I'm about to tell you. Dummy proof of how to develop a debt retirement plan. Dummy proof. Ready? What you do is you go on the internet, thing called Amazon.com, and you find this book by Dave Ramsey called The Total Money Maker. And I just looked last night, you can find a $15 hardcover, $13 in Kindle. You go buy this book, and you read this book, and you do what this book tells you. Now, some of you are saying, hey, Father Anthony, I can't afford a book. You know what I mean? I can't, it's expensive. And Okay, make it even easier for you. You go to these things, they still have these things called bookstores. Y'all have a bookstore? Barnes and Noble, you go to them, you find this book, you sit down on the couch, and you open chapter 7 on page 109 and 132, and you read it, and you enjoy your time there, and you do what it tells you to do. Now, some of you are saying, well, I can't afford it, and I don't have the time to go to all the way to a bookstore. I don't know what them things are called. You know what? I got you covered as well. You go to the bookstore, you find this book, you pull out your smartphone, which I don't know how you can afford because you shouldn't be able to afford it, and you go to page 112 and 113, and you take a picture of page 112 to 113, and you do exactly what it tells you to do. And then, after you've done it, and you've built your way out of debt, you go back to that bookstore, and you buy the book, and you read the rest of it. There is no shortage of resources out there to help you get out of debt and to build financial margin, to get to a place of financial health. In fact, just a few months ago, we did FPU, Financial Peace University. Some I know some people here attended that. It's like a one-day seminar for people to help them learn these principles. Okay, Dave Ramsey is the one who developed that as well. There's no shortage of resources, but you must decide and say, I am done believing that standard of living equals quality of life. I am done believing that lie. Because that lie has messed me up. It's the cliche. How many times have we heard this cliche? We see it in the movies all the time. You open the closet full of clothes and the lady exclaims, I have nothing to wear. This is how we live our lives today. More stuff than ever before. Fancier cars, fancier gadgets, more, more luxuries than anyone else, any other generation in the history of the world. And more miserable than anyone else as well. And poorer relationships. And time to stand and pray. And I can't concentrate on prayer. Why? Because I'm thinking about, well, I got to get to work because I got to work overtime because I got to pay the bills. And got to spend time with my parents. Who got time to spend with my parents? Because I'm busy and I don't got time. And I want to help this person in need, but I can't help this person in need. And I know the church says that I should tithe. And I know I should tithe. And the Bible says I should tithe. And the Bible says it's a huge blessing on me when I tithe. And I say, you know what? I just can't afford it. I can't afford to get that blessing in my life right now. Man, we need to get out of that state. We need to get to a state where we are healthy, where we are income, spending, margin. I guarantee you this. Creating margin will take discipline, and it probably will lower your standard of living. It will lower your standard of living, but I guarantee you it will increase your quality of life. And to me, it's a no-brainer when you make that trade. Let's stand together and say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen.
Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed upon us. And we realize, dear Lord, that when it comes to money and resources and stuff, we've been given more than so many people would like yearn to be where we are and have what we have. Even we ourselves yearn to be at this state when we, when we had less. We, we repent, Lord, for the way that we've treated the stuff you've given us and we've taken it for granted and we just kind of approached it in a greedy manner. I pray that you'd help all of us, families, singles, young people, old people. doesn't matter, Lord. Help, I pray that you'd help all of us to, to like walk in line with your commandments on how we manage our money. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, in advance for the coming year, which you're, you're giving to us. And we know that you're going to do great things when we try to walk in obedience to your commands. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ the prayers of all your saints. Lord, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.